My film recommendation in today's video is Whistle Down the Wind, a film that was released in 1961 and shot in Lancashire in what looked like when you watch the film, it's a black and white film, in quite atrocious weather, in a bleak sort of cold wintry weather, everyone's wearing heavy coats. It's a, a marvellous film, it's a classic of course, and it stars Hayley Mills, Bernard Lee and Alan Bates, amongst uh, a whole host of other children. It um, <clears throat> was a book by Mary, ha Mary Haley Bell, who was actually Haley Mills's mother. She was the daughter, Haley Mills, of Mary Haley Bell and John Mills. And Mary Haley Bell wrote the original story um, with her own children in mind. And of course, Haley Mills went on to play the lead role. It's interesting, I got hold of the book, and again, I looked for it, it's a slim little novel, and having seen the film many times and been impressed with it, and I, and I, I love the film, it's, it's a very charming film, I thought the novel might bring more to uh, the table, as it were. But actually, I have to say, uh, I found the novel difficult to read, and quite basic really. Um, I didn't really know what to make of it. It's the same actually with Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Now uh, I'm not putting that up as a contender for Made in England as such, although it is quintessentially English and some of it was shot uh, abroad and some of that was shot in England. Of course most of it was in England, but of course Dick Van Dyke was not English by any means of the imagination. Um, but that was written by Ian Fleming and I got the book of that uh, on the strength of how marvellous the film was. And I, again, I was bitterly disappointed. Usually I find that the book is far better and more in depth and much more interesting than the film because a film adaptation can only take a certain amount from a, a book. Uh, whereas, a, um, whereas a book, of course, can go into depth on certain issues and subjects and can take you on a, a a longer and more informed journey. Also, of course, the pictures are in your mind, the characters develop in a, in a completely different way. So that wasn't the case with Whistle Down the Wind. It's a very charming film. Um, it's, as I say, it had Hayley Mills, Bernard Lee and Alan Bates, and it was directed by Brian Forbes and produced by Richard Attenborough, who later on went into direction, but I understand at that time he wasn't that interested in direction. He and Brian Forbes, from what I understand, and people can correct me if I'm wrong here, because I'm not really a film critic by any means, um, they formed a, a partnership to make a number of films, and this was one of them. A beautifully crafted film, um, but extremely simple in both the concept and its execution. And yet, as I say, there's just something remarkably charming about it. Again, I don't want to give the whole plot away, except that three children who live on a farm, they stumble across a man who happens to be a murderer um, on the run, hiding in their barn. And for one reason or another, they believe that he is Jesus returned. And they have so much faith that he is Jesus, despite the injuries that he's got, his manner, his lack of knowledge of the Bible, um, and his, um, <clears throat> his sort of reticence to actually tell them a story or uh, do anything Messiah-like. Um, it is, it is, a story in which that innocence, that acceptance that children do, just as much as, you know, they think of Father Christmas in the same way, they will willingly believe and overlook what adults have grown to realise isn't so. And so we see, the, we see the film evolve pretty much from their point of view, although we get a glimpse at uh, how the adults are responding to this. There's a sequence, for example, in which Bernard Lee, who is the, the three children's father, is trying, has heard that there is this murderer on the run, and he's trying to have a word with his children about talking to strange men. And it, it's, 
you can see that there was a gulf between parents and children. He is bringing up his kids on his own. The wife has died. He has, um, I, I, it's his wife's mother, I think, who is left holding uh, most of the maternal duties. And it's quite a harsh uh, living up there where you get your, your head smacked if you don't eat up your dinner or you, you give them a bit of lip and what have you. Although they have a certain amount of freedom of running around on the farm. The landscape is, of course, extremely beautiful, but it's, um, it's hidden pretty much in this mist and this wet weather, which I gather is quite true because um, an old friend of mine, Harriet, her father lives up in that neck of the woods. And I have been around there, but not to the actual location where the farm is. And I would love to go back and, and have a look at it. I gather that it's a bit of a pilgrim for people who enjoy the film to see if any remnants of the farm is still there. After all, it is uh, some 60 years now since the film was made. And um, it's right in the lee, I think I've got this right, of the Pendle Hill, where the Pendle Witches, uh, the legend of the Pendle Witches are supposed to be. Uh, beautiful landscape, um, rolling hills, um, stone walling, and, um, and quite desolate, which I think is where the title comes from, Whistle Down the Wind, as the, the wind is whistling through desolate, isolated place. Originally in the book, it was set in Kent, but uh, Richard Attenborough and Brian Forbes thought that not really the appropriate setting visually. And I think they did a brilliant job of finding a farm um, up there in Lancashire, which it, it does, you do get that feeling of um, being remote, the, the uh, architecture of the, the, the geology, really, I suppose, of the, of the, of the stone buildings as well, being quite hard as nail and hardy people. It starts, and this is no uh, spoiler, with the farmhand, played by Norman Bird, brilliant character actor, uh, about to, and he does, throw three kittens into an old pond, and they're in a sack. But the kids rescue those, and it's through the rescue of those kittens that the, the story starts to unfold. The, the kid actors, the children actors, are brilliant. Hayley Mills is particularly good, of course. But um, Alan Barnes, who I don't think went on to do any other acting whatsoever, and I think he's been plagued a bit by this role, who must have been, I'm not quite sure how old he was, about 10, but he was a short guy uh, at the time. Extremely expressive face and so charming. Um, and yet such a, a scoundrel and a, and a wagster and a, and a, a rascal. But, a, a, you know, you can see that he could have made a brilliant character actor in latter life had he had chosen to go into that sort of thing, which I don't think he did. Um, and there is some fantastic lines that he's got, or I cannot imagine anybody else delivering them. This is this, you know, young little kid in a little jacket on a farm with his hat. Uh, the classic line is, it isn't Jesus, it's just a fella. Uh, in that sort of Lancash Lancasterian, if I could speak, would be useful, accent. Um, it, it's just on the money. It's quite a longish film, or it seems a longish film. I watched it last night before uh, recording this just to re-familiarise myself with it. Um, and I know it so well. It's, it has that bleakness that it draws you in. And again, that simple charm of the, there's a, a number of scenes in which they're inside the house, in the, in the smallish farmhouse, which looks like an old Georgian farmhouse. And uh, the sort of domesticity of, of meals, the basic nature of living away from everything, the privy, which is outside somewhere, we don't actually see it, but Hayley Mills uh, goes, her character uh, makes an excuse to go to the privy, but actually she goes running off to the barn to see Jesus. Um, the interplay with the parents and the aunt is, is just wonderful. And then there's, there's a moment where all the kids know about this, this, um, this character, and they've gone in, they've seen Jesus, as they think, and little 
Alan Barnes, his character, which is Charlie Bostock, um, accidentally he's, he's taking food to give to this guy because this chap's injured, he can't escape at the barn where he's been hiding. And little Alan Barnes um, is caught taking two bits of cake. Um, no, that's right, hang on, I've got that wrong. It's the middle daughter whose name, the, the actress, who again was very young, I've I, um, forgotten what her name is, but she plays Nan. Um, I'm not quite sure what Nan would be short for, but that was it. She's not a Nan, as in, you know, your, your Nan, as in a, a grandmother or anything. And she is caught and she says that she, she, doesn't, she doesn't want to say who it's for. And then little Alan Barnes says it's for Jesus. I think that's right. I may have got that bit wrong. But the point was that everybody... Oh, no, that's right. It is her. Sorry, I'm getting myself in a muddle here. She says it's for Jesus and everybody's looking at her. And, and Bernard Lee, there's something menacing about that, I guess, because he knows that there is this man on the loose. And so he is confused and questioning her. And, uh, and little Alan Barn pipes up. It's not Jesus. It's just a fella. Um, it... It is a remarkable film and again it's one of those that hits the heartstrings because it takes you back I think to your own childhood, to that innocence, that somewhat romantic, I mean if you're of a certain age that's so much romantic youth of, of an England that perhaps we never actually experienced but is somehow, if you're English, I think part of your DNA. It's so difficult to explain. I think if you I would be interested to know what people who don't who aren't English feel about these those type of films because they may not quite um, it may not just pull into that I don't know that sensibility that there's something there's something very magical about the film it isn't going to be for everybody by any means like all my recommendations of course these are very specific it's made in England it's very quintessential English in its own way it's gritty and it's so different from the Leslie Howard um, Pimpernel Smith that I was talking about last time or indeed this happy breed it, and I wanted to find this cross-section um, of films. The book was adapted uh, for screenplay by Keith Waterhouse and Willis Hall uh, so you don't get the original story and I think they they made a, rem a, a remarkable film that still holds its own even now. It's the sort of film I think it would be great for children. I mean, it's not really, it's, it's, although it stars children, it's not really a children's film, although, of course, children can watch it. I don't know what children would make of it these days. It would be extremely unreal, I think, even though it's only 60 years ago. I think if young kids watched it, it, it would be too slow, not enough is happening, and the importance of the event, the gullibility of the children in the story I think wouldn't resonate at all and to me that's a bit of a shame it's, it's quite sad I think that the youth of today would would look at this and feel so alienated from it for a start it's all in the countryside in villages and things and very few children these days are lucky enough to grow up in the countryside or have any experience of that type of world the lack of cars, um, the, the open spaces, the, the very basic nature really of existence and that ability just to play in the fields. I think there is something that, that speaks, I mean it's nostalgic of course, but I wonder how the next generation would ever view this kind of production. Anyway, it's my recommendation. Um, you may well have seen it or you may not. I'd be interested in your comments. Thank you for watching this. And I hope in the future to do a few more uh, film recommendations made in England that shows off this quintessential country and its incredible texture of um, wonderful things. Till next time, bye-bye.